So let's dig right into some of the big news this week. Fukushima, right? We all remember what happened in Japan. How long ago was that now? That was... Um, four years ago. Two, four years ago. I was wow. going to say two years ago, but how time flies. There's still melting down occurring. There's melting happening in the cores in that uh, reactor chamber. And people are trying to figure out still how they can get in to see what's happening there without actually sending people in, saving as much human life as possible, not putting people in danger. How can we get a view of what's going on? What kind of robots? What kind of sensors? What can we do? And most recent news is coming out of Los Alamos National Laboratory. They're partnering up with Toshiba. And Los Alamos has been developing a method of that is going to let them use cosmic rays to peer into the cores of the Fukushima Daiichi reactors, creating very high resolution images of the damaged nuclear material that's inside and not actually having to go into the cores themselves. Cosmic rays! Using cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are these high energy particles that come from space and uh, they don't really interact with a lot of stuff. They pass through things all the time. We're getting bombarded by co cosmic rays co constantly. However, some materials like this, nu this nuclear fissile material, it is more reactive with these kinds of particles or interreactive with these kinds of particles than, um, than say you or, or I would be. And so you're able, they are able to use this to see how these rays coming in, what kind of things spin off the, as the particles hit um, interactions take place and electrons and other small uh, particles, bits of the material, spray off. And so they can use that to get a picture of what's in there. And so it's kind of, it's a pretty neat, it's a pretty neat thing. And they've got, um, there's a video that's available uh, through Los Alamos about how they're going to, be, that discusses how they're going to be probing with cosmic rays. Um, Let's see if I can get a little bit of a screen share going here without destroying everything. Do you know personally of any scientists or engineers that are in the process of developing new technology, robots or otherwise, to deal with Fukushima? And does any of it seem hopeful or promising to you? Right, okay. Um, uh, no is the answer to that. Uh, I, I think that, um, that all of the work that had been done with robots to try and sort out Chernobyl showed that it's impossible to use uh, robots because the problem is that the electronic systems that robots work on cannot sustain, um, uh, they cannot function when the radiation fields get too high because the radio see, when radiation impinges on, 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 on a substance, on, on a new material, what it does is it creates electrons. That's why it's called ionizing radiation. It ion it, it, it's absorbed by the material, and it ionizes the material, which means that it kicks electrons out of the material. Now, the problem is that robots work on electrons. Your computer works on electrons. All of these chips, all of the, all the electronic chips that, that, that you, people use are all, are, are all work on electrons. I and mean, you can't have a system where the electrons are just randomly being kicked out all over the place because you know, ultimately the, the whole thing gets scrambled. And that's what they found in, in, in um, Chernobyl. And they, had a, they, had a, they, had, they tried everything. They tried the uh, German, Germans had some very fancy robots. And then they tried uh, robots from somewhere else. And they built their own robots. And none of the robots worked. They worked up to the point where they got into the high radiation fields, and then they just went mad, went around in circles, and sort of fell off the side. That's why, in the end, in Chernobyl, they had to send men in. They called them bio robots, and they just they just called up 20,000 men from the reserve army list, and they, they, they put roofing lead around them and, and sent them in to pick up this stuff by their bare hands and throw it, throw it over the side. And uh, of course, they all died. Uh, you won't hear that. I mean, the international nuclear industry. Says that, says, says that nobody really died after Chernobyl except a few of the firemen right at the beginning. But there, there's an enormous number of, of uh, people who died because the Russians sent in these, these young men. And the young men just got huge radiation effects and then they died, mostly died before they were 40. Terrifying. 
that this can't happen in Japan and the robots won't work. So as I say, there's nothing you can do. They just have to dig around it, isolate it, put up a big notice saying mankind's folly and, and keep it cool for, the, you know, for another thousand years or however long it is. Um. So when the uh, the tsunami hit and just breached the reactors, it's just been difficult to get in there. And we had the melting down. We know that the reactor core is melted and the materials moved. And they're going to use muons that are going through to make a radiograph. Which are not kitten particles. No. No. That's adorable. <laughs> I'm a new one. Yeah. No kittens involved. No kittens, no um, kittens involved. But um, it's a it's an interesting that's new awesome. method. Yeah. New method. Way to get in there. Uh, save a few lives. And find out exactly what's going on. And what was it? Uh, our interview a couple of weeks ago, last week, um, with. Uh, last week talking about um, the kelp project, trying to figure out about radiation hitting our shores. Still no real sense of radiation hitting our shores whatsoever. Oh, yes, and Goldazator, I know I've got three Google notifications. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sharing. Just three? Just three right there, yeah. Um, all right, brains. Brains, brains, and more brains. You guys ready for this? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, well, you say there's no solution to the waste, but there is a solution to the waste, and the solution to the waste is to just leave it exactly where it is and to have somebody look at it for, for a million years, you know. So, so they just have to have all these zombies who are there at the moment sitting there doing nothing who are going to just have to sit there and their children are going to sit there and their children's children and so on looking at the waste and making sure that it doesn't leak out of the tanks. And if it starts to look like it's going to leak out of the tanks, they build another tank around that tank, and then they build another tank around the tank that they built around that tank and so on you know, to infinity. And that is a solution to the waste, because then the waste will just stay where it is now, and it won't get any worse. And if they make more waste, they'll have to put it inside that tank and leave it there. And as far as contaminated land is concerned, and places like Sellafield and all that, they'll just have to put a fence around it and say, this is contaminated land, do not enter. And so that's the best we can do. I mean, it doesn't help to put it down the hole in the ground. I mean, you may as well put it somewhere where you can keep an eye on it and make sure it doesn't escape. So that's the solution. And why not put a hole in the ground? Ah, well, because then if something goes wrong, you can't do anything about it. That's the point. And what could be could go wrong there? Oh, God, well, loads of things could go wrong. I mean, the main thing that would go wrong is that it go, it's, it's a hole in, in the ground is not a secured depository, you know? I mean, you put it into a hole in the ground and then there's a crack in the hole in the ground or maybe there's a, an earthquake or, or maybe there's a fault that you didn't know about or maybe there's some water movement that, that changes over a period of time and we're talking geological time scale, so, you know, just about everywhere where they've suggested putting it in a hole in the ground has had a geological um, fault occurring, you know, uh, 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 in, in the last thousand years, never mind about, you know, the next million years or whatever it is it has for the half-life of these uraniums and plutoniums. So you can't, you can't actually guarantee that if you put it in a hole in the ground, something won't go wrong. And you can't pull it out of the hole in the ground, that's the point. I mean, the, the, the force mark idea is not one in which they put it down in the hole in the ground and then they can take it out if something goes wrong. They can't. They just pop it down and pop the next one down and pop the next one down and so on and send it all down there and then they seal it all up. But if something goes wrong, then they can't do anything. Whereas if it's where it is at the moment, at Sellafield or wherever it is, above ground or in some kind of big hangar or big kind of area where they kind of look at it, then they can look at it. And if something goes wrong and they've got all their detectors and their Geiger counters and whatnot, then they can just repackage it and put something around it. But they have to sit there. Yeah, they have to sit there forever. Absolutely, yeah, sure. Well, it serves them right, isn't it? Shouldn't have made it in the first place. And I've no doubt they'll pay them a lot of money for sitting there. <laughs> so, yeah, they can sit there. And, and, I mean, maybe they should have special uniforms, like, you know, guard of the nuclear waste, and they could have, like, special kind of green uniforms with special badges, like Superman or something, you know? They make them feel good. <laughs> I've always thought it quite good to have special uniforms. 
in all the science fiction stories they did special uniforms, you know. So you could say, what's your daddy do? Oh, he's a god of the nuclear waste. Oh, no. <laughs> what a useful job, George. Yes, it is, isn't it?